Hello and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor, as with me as always is... Phil, Phil, me, and Parrish. That's the man. Oh, Philip, 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 me, and Parrish. Um, next verse, Tim is the first. A little bit louder, a little bit worse. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um, quick bits of correction. So last week... I did go on a bit of a loving rant, I'd like to say. A loving rant, because I did constantly praise their show. But I misstated their name a few times. So the show that I like for comic book podcasting is a show called Wait What? That's W-A-I-T-W-H-A-T. And there's probably some uh, exclamation points and uh, other such uh you know, exclamation point, question marks that follow it. Yeah, but you said, uh, wait, wait you said, what? Wait, it's kind of nice. Wait, wait. Yeah, I said wait, wait a few times. Wait, wait is also a very good podcast, but that's a news quiz from NPR. Um, highly recommend you watch that one. Listen to that one too. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Paula Poundstone's on it. And, nice. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill Curtis, the voice of Chicago. So uh, at least that's what he says. I don't know. I don't live in Chicago. I have to ask Rob Telsky. If Bill Curtis is really the voice of Chicago, is he really legendary anchorman Bill Curtis? Or is he just playing us all for saps for not living in Market 3? Entirely possible. So, yes. And it also, I called uh, Jeff Lester Phil Lester. Because when I think of people who simply know everything about comic books, I always assume their name is Phil. And instead, it was actually Jeff Lester and Graham McMillan in the Wait What podcast, a great place to go for your uh, comic book uh, and pop cultural needs. Also, they do a Baxter Building reread. Right now, they're into the John Byrne era, so this is the time to get in, kids. Uh, enjoy it while you can. Okay. Um the podcast i hope you enjoy it uh news today in the world of um <sighs> the marvel cinematic universe well actually i got two news i got good news and i got bad news which do you want phil do you want the good news or the bad news first uh let's start with the bad news okay yeah my producer agrees if you didn't hear uh Trist- tristan uh tristan jonah esser my producer uh did suggest we go with bad news first so the bad news is Ah, uh, they finally released a clip. Yes. You know, the producer isn't actually supposed to appear on camera. Yes, there we go. Um, okay, that's fine. The music stopped. No, no, no. Later, later, later. Uh, um, so the bad news is, is that they finally realized, oh, Medusa's hair move in Inhumans. And so we got a clip with, with Medusa's hair moves. I told and, you they were saving that for something, and they saved it for Comic Con. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that's what they were saving, they should have saved it some more. Because honestly, you know, it was just such a like I said, Medusa's hair has to be a living sentience. Medusa's hair to give you to give you a thought. Medusa's hair is probably powered by her unconscious mind not her conscious mind. You know, it is probably mostly respective. It is probably mostly hind brain. So that thing should always be in motion. And when we actually do see it, and it just like, and it does like a little pushy thing at, I believe it was Maximus. It's like, uh, you're a bad man, Maximus. Uh, uh, uh. It's like that. No, I want to see Medusa grabbing someone by her hair, lifting them up, and throwing them against the wall. I want to see her with freaking, you know, Hulk smash level strength, just tearing something apart with this amazing super powered hair. You want to see everything? You, know? you want to it's, see everything in the trailer? I want to not be disappointed by a trailer. Yeah, then, then watch. They'll give you that That's in the trailer. A, It'll be like that you last start off with. House. It'll be like the last Fantastic Four. They'll give you something in the trailer and then watch. It won't make it to the TV show. Look, here's the thing. You have to get me interested, especially if you want me to go buy a freaking IMAX ticket to see this nonsense. And you start off with stick straight hair, you know, like she just had a blowout. And then you go to, oh, no, we have slightly more voluminous hair now. It, but but it doesn't move. It's just like, oh, now she's got a little curl. And now it's like, you know, 
oh, it's going to move, but it's like, you know, it's like, you bad, bad, bad man, Maximus. <laughs> bad, bad man. That's not Medusa. But I that think, weakening of Medusa is pathetic. I think they're I think they're getting nervous too because I was talking to Rob Southgate today. You could uh, check out uh this week in Geek. Uh, we talked some uh, Comic Con stuff. Uh I guess Rob was saying they've they've announced now. You know, before they're like, Oh, we're not crossing over with Agents of Shield. I guess now they're talking about doing a crossover with Agents of Shield somehow. We're having some of the characters appear. Okay. See, that is the level of desperation. <laughs> We're like, we're going to be on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's like, yeah, nobody wants to be on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Even though it's awesome. Even though everyone Friday should night. want to be on Friday night. Agents Woo! of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. But now they're now they're calling up poor old Clark Gregg and um, uh, Help us oh God, go why, why am I and the actress who plays uh, Daisy Johnson's uh, name? Um, Chloe Bennett. They're going to have. Mm-hmm. So Chloe Bennett and Craig Johnson are going to. You got to say, it's our day off. What? Okay. We got. In fact, they should have a scene where, like, oh, why are we here, Colson? It's supposed to be my day off. It's like, I know it's an emergency. They needed us to show up. You know, they need to have that scene. They need to hang a hat on how bad this is. Um, Daisy's hair is going to move more than Medusa's does. Yeah, well, here's what I'll say. It was a it was a better trailer. Mm. It was better, but you know. And here's what I'm gonna say. It, I'm, I can't say it's gonna be a bad show. Mm. Okay, I really can't say that. I can say I don't have faith it's gonna be a good show, and I can say they certainly have missed what they should have been, what they should have understood about these characters. Mm-hmm. See, here's what they don't understand, and this is this. I don't know who it is, but you know we always rip on DC for its misogyny, for its not trusting Wonder Woman when obviously Wonder Woman was always their best bet. Hydrogen gas. Oh, there's news about uh, DC too. But go ahead, make your point. Okay, we'll get to DC in a minute because actually I've got some nice fan theories about DC and like why Wonder Woman was was really has been their best show. But they, and it's, but, I think it's stuff that Tyler's gonna like. But they made a big announcement um, about the movies. Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. But let me continue to rag on Marvel, these idiots, <laughs> a little bit more. Um, you know, here's the thing. Someone decided the Inhumans matriarchal and shouldn't have a matriarchal storyline, which is interesting because, yes, officially they aren't matriarchal, except that the female power of Medusa and Crystal to the overall arc of the inhuman saga is central you know that's the thing it's like you know the first inhuman we meet is medusa mm-hmm. you know then we meet the other inhumans but crystal becomes the resident inhuman at the baxter building the inhuman story is always centered around medusa or crystal no one cares about black bolt there's never head. been a you know the, the, the biggest the biggest breakout of this thing, you know, Triton had a cameo on Spider-Man and the Web Warriors or Sparta, one of the Spider-Man, recent yeah. Spider-Man series. Okay. That was Triton's big break, making him a teenager. He's a teenager in this, so they're clearly copying that. But, dude, you don't make this a Triton-centric show. Well, see, they, they, they've messed up the the beginnings then because they don't have Fantastic Four. So should Medusa or Crystal have, like, shown up in, like, this last season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Then you're like, hey, you know, there's your Thor and the Inhumans. Honestly, as I've been saying, they should have had Medusa back. You know, here's the problem. Because I'll guarantee you they wanted to have Medusa at whatever that first, you know, Adelan Light place was, you know? Mm-hmm. In what was that the third season or was that the second season of Agents of Shield? Third, I think. Pretty sure. Third, third, yeah. You know, uh, you know, heck, I think they probably wanted to have Medusa be Sky's mom, but you know, because mm-hmm. I could have gotten behind an Asian Medusa. Why not? You know, because at first they're probably like, oh, we're saving them, we're saving all these characters for the movies, and then that didn't pan out. So, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it is. Is they kind of, they kind of, they kind of hedge their bets, which was, you know, here's the thing about I'm going to say for Marvel. They do their best work when they don't hedge their bets. Mm. When they're not trying to, they do their best work when they leave it all out on the table. When they say, you know what? It's Iron Man. Let's just go right out. Let's do, let's do a, a, a nice little remake on it. Let's, let's throw the cannon out the window. You know, you know, let's say, let's have them say, you know what? I am Iron Man at the end. Just like in, um, at the end of Homecoming, it's like, yep, yeah, now my Aunt May knows, you know? 
we're not going to play the we're not going to play the nerd game of just spoon feeding you what you've already read. Mm-hmm. We're going to change the story so even the nerds are like, I have no idea what happens next. And I think that is what Marvel's strength is. Now, granted, you could say, well, aren't they doing that by focusing on these male characters? Yes, arguably. You know, because what we don't have enough of right now is white male leading men in comic book movies. That's right. But, <laughs> but you know, there is altering the history and there is completely throwing the formula out the window and you know medusa you know we see crystal do like a little i don't know a little electric like a little tesla ball thing you know Mm -hmm. and it's like you know it's like so underwhelming meanwhile gorgon is doing a seismic stomp that's good and you know we've seen black you know which is okay you yeah, know, we we've seen Lockjaw do a little uh, spaghetti f- uh, fade, and that's nice. You know, uh, but you know, in general, in general, it seems like something that was made because I don't even know why. Because it's not like the rights were expiring. Oh, you know what? Okay, crazy fan theory time. You ready for crazy fan theory time? Yes. Do you know why we're getting a subpar in humans? Why? Because the rights were about to revert back to Marvel Studios. So Marvel... Uh, oh, for the, for the movie. Exactly. So that was obviously mm. still under... Um, uh, who runs the Marvel TV v- division? Uh, it's an actual comic book guy. Um, oh, is it Loeb? Jeff Loeb? Loeb, yeah. So it was about... So Loeb realized he was going to lose the Inhuman Royal family if he didn't lo- use them. Hmm. To use them in Agents of Shield, because back before the separation, the movie still took precedent. But after the separation, since Loeb already had the Inhumans at Marvel Television, he could still hold on to them unless he didn't do something with them. So he is he is making this so that Foggy doesn't get the Inhumans. This is this is the the Roger Corman Fantastic Four all over again. Just trying to hold on to the rights. And it's ironic. It's silly because it's rights held by the same overall company. But it's the two divisions, the two ants on, on Emperor Mouse's big pile of honey fight, fighting it out. So that is my crazy fan theory about why we're getting a subpar in humans series forced down our throats. Well, it's the same problem that most of these properties had come, come across. The suits. Too much interference by the suits. Here's what I want to say. It's not the suit. It's a couple of guys in suits, but they're both the creative suits. Mm-hmm. It's not Disney execs sitting there saying, yeah, sure. It's it's the guy, you know, it's these two guys who are ostensibly creators, Feige and Loeb, you know, saying, you know, I want to make sure I don't lose this property. And so they get into the fight. And as a result, you know, Feige or Loeb has to put this thing out. You know, I, I think, honestly, I don't know what's going to happen with this. Like I said, I think we're going to get our eight episodes, and we're never going to mention Medusa again. All I know is they're in big trouble because, I mean, you're like, I mean, you're such a hardcore Marvel fan. You put up with a lot. I mean, even on the DC side, I mean, you enjoy, you're one of the handful that enjoy Powerless. And, I mean, yeah. you're... I mean, you you hey. talk good about Powerless, and you're crapping all over in humans. They're in I trouble. Will, I will sit... To- and they're not getting you. They're in and, trouble. And tell you how good Red Brown was as Captain America. Exactly. With a straight face. I, you know, no, it's not Captain America. I know it's no first Avenger. But as a story of a, you know, of a hero with super soldier serum, Red Brown's Captain America is actually pretty good. And right. it has its own it's origin, its own mythos. And I do love the Red Brown Captain Americas, you know. I even like the 1960s Spider-Man, even uh, even though, like our current Spider-Man, no Uncle Ben and no mention of him, you know? Um, but, I mean, done, done right, this show should be, like, the PG-rated version of, like, Game of Thrones. Yeah, and, you know, it may be, the problem is, is that, you know what it is, is that I know Medusa would have cost you money, mm-hmm. but... Is that the other problem? I, it should have stayed a movie. Do you have a bigger budget? Yeah. You wouldn't have to stretch it out for at least eight hours. You could, you know, if you did a two-hour movie. Well, I mean, obviously their argument is that it is a movie. Yeah. But it's only an IMAX movie. Well, those first what, two, one or two episodes. Yeah, the two, the two, like your big season premiere, like, you know, 
two hour adventure. Is that because obviously the first two episodes? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's like you're getting the word out more. You know, more advertising with the IMAX stuff. But they did. Did they do that so they could get a bigger budget? Maybe. Well, the idea with the IMAX is so. Here's the thing. By doing an exclusive IMAX release. See, IMAX is the most expensive ticket. So if you're getting an IMAX showing, you have you need fewer people to make more money, arguably, because assumably these two episodes aren't overpriced. And here's the thing. You can, again, make this argument that once you have the computer animation down for Medusa's hair, it's cheaper to reuse it as long as you don't have her do something new. The problem is, is that if they're not going to have her use her powers interestingly, it really breaks the thing down. It's like, you know, like having your hair move. Here's the thing. Medusa's hair moving is only because her hair is super strong. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if my hair moved, you wouldn't really think much of it because it's just hair. It's more than hair. It's like this super strong you know, hair that can like bend steel, you know, Mm -hmm. it's hair that can like, you know, really do damage on you on superhumans. It can do damage. And if you make it just be like wispy little hair, that's moving, you know, and that's the thing is like, you don't even have, see, that's the thing to me is you don't have to have her hair doing that much. So most of the time it can be just sort of like waving in the breeze, but when she uses it, I want it to really, Here's the thing. It's like she should not use it except when she is smashing things. That's my take on it. Because if you want to do that, but it should like always be have some kind of movement, have some kind of a randomized pattern to it because mm-hmm. it is a living thing. It should be breathing and moving just in the same way you don't, you know, no, no part of you is ever really still. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're breathing, when you're sitting, you know, every part of you is always in motion. Her hair should be like that. And Medusa's hair is the thing that is destroying the show, you know, because it is this thing that should be amazing. And it just keeps on looking pathetic. And I, I just can't even at this point. But that's but my I mean, statement is I can't even. But are we spoil? I mean, who knows about the story? Is sort you know they're probably going to problem with the story. But are we like spoiled in our age of CGI and motion capture and even practical I don't think effects? So no, you know, well, well, because I think even I was like if they had done it with practical effects, if they had done it with like a woman with a big, big old wig, like I said, she doesn't Strings. have to be. Yeah, honestly, yes. It could have been done with strings. It could have been, honestly, just having her constantly under a fan. The look you wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. You want it to just look like it's always in this motion. You know, I think that even that might have been, like, even better. Just always have her, you know, always have her having, like, just weird wind blowing her hair because her hair is always off, like, antennae, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that might have been cool. And then when you want her to do something, you really have that hair shoot out, you know? And just, like, grab things and pull them in, you know? Like I said, to see her hair, like, just pushing Maximus, it's like, no. Her hair should be lifting him off the ground, holding him by the neck, and saying, who the schmeck do you think you are, Maximus? You are the little brother of the king. I mean, you don't mess with the royal family. While the rest you of You mess the with the royal family, Tristan? No, no yeah. exactly. While the rest of her doesn't move, just the hair moves, and she, maybe she's not even looking at him and just like, who, yeah, who are, you know, who do you think exactly. you are? Exactly. That is what it should be. That is how you do that, and mm-hmm. they didn't. Okay. I love you. you. Let me do my podcast. 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 Okay. Anyway, (laughs) that's my boy. Uh, So where were we? Um, Bad hair. Bad hair. So that's enough about bad hair. Let's. Do you want to get to the good news, Phil? Sure. Yes, today's Medusa's bad hair day. Thank you, Tristan. There we have a title for today's episode: Medusa's bad hair day. Writing it down. So the good news is, and again, this I don't know much we're going to take this. This may be with a grain of salt because I haven't seen it really corroborated by anything except like internet rumor. But the current buzz is, the current buzz is, Scorpion, Matt Gargan from Homecoming, will be in the exclusively Sony produced Silver Sable Black, Silver, Silver Sable Black Cat movie. Hmm. And to which I say, oh. 
because it creates this it creates this establishment that those Sony movies, while not officially under the Feige banner, are connected to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or Sony's going to expand their deal. But that is the rumor right now that Matt Gargan, Matt Gargan, Gargan will be in the Black Cat Silver Sable film. I'm trying to remember. And, maybe I'll look it up. I thought they, yeah, I thought I saw that, and I thought they said maybe a few other Spider-Man villains in it also. Yeah, well, I imagine. I mean, well, you know, the thing is, all they have is Spider-Man villains, so they kind of have to have Spider-Man villains in it. You know, they don't really have an option to. I mean, they could create their own characters. You know, like Michelle Jones. Yeah, I mean, it could. It MJ could be, to her friends. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it could just be like a spy movie. You know, just like random. <laughs> Well, I think what it is, is they have, and I think, here's the thing, I think part of it is, is they may even have a little more leeway now with uh, Marvel and what they're going to put in, you know, they may be, you know, like I said, if they're going to have Gargan, if they're going to have Gargan in the outside of the MCU, you know, then I think that basically what it is, is it's this idea that um, Marvel and Sony have kind of got their truce on. And here's the thing, something I didn't realize is that apparently Sony did have final cut on the Spider-Man film, which really surprised me because the whole idea was to have, you know, Marvel have the final cut, you know, that Marvel would have have the larger creative control. But no, Sony still kept it. They let Marvel write it, but Sony still kept the creative control. Yeah, but how so, much, How much? I mean, look at Marvel's track record. How much was Sony going to be like, oh no, we don't want that in the movie. And, uh, you know, the MCU guys would be like, really? Are you sure? Yeah, you know, of course. Yeah, of course. Let's all remember this is uh, well. You know, this is this is pre uh, Inhumans, but it was post Iron Fist. So you know, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I do think that's great. I you know, I think it's good that 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 when they do do their because basically what it means is is that the Silver Sable film film oh they're Venom, talking like Venom film are going to be Marvel Cinematic adjacent. And all those characters may show up in a uh, future Spider-Man or even Avengers or other films. Mm-hmm. And so that's the good news. They're talking like four villains for this. Uh, yeah, they're talking Scorpion. Uh, they're talking mm-hmm. Mendel Strom, who worked for Norman Osborn as like a scientist. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Tarantula. Like a, oh, can't see it, but he's like a South American villain. Uh, yeah. And the Chameleon. Oh, the Chameleon. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I've never really understood what the chameleon's thing was. Oh, wait, there's another he, one like, too. Impersonates people. Well, he was like a spy. He was like, I mean, they made it when his first appearance. He was like, uh, what was it, a Russian spy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they can make him have. It's one of these non-powered supervillains that you're like, okay, you know. Well, I mean, depending on if they give Black Cat of bad luck powers, I mean, Silver Sable has no powers. Yeah, but that's also because that. But that's also their. You know, the Black Bull is their, you know, Marvel Sirens. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, and you know who... Is it that Marvel's going to have their Sirens before DC does? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know who else they're saying? Uh, there's another villain, Tombstone. Tombstone, yeah. And again, a guy without really any powers, you know? Uh, I mean, he got powers later on, like, just like super strength and like some oh, limited... Did he get powers? Everything. As far as I knew, it was just like supposed to be a big a big guy. With, he was, but then he, he got caught in some kind of, you know, of course, you know... Yeah. I don't want to say hydrogen gas, but um, he's so basically he had a power. So he's basically like you know, Killer Croc was originally just a big guy with a with a skin condition. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, and yeah. then they this, sort of well, let's make him superhumanly strong. Let's let, let him breathe underwater. What the heck, you know? Yeah, super strength and some vulnerability, but yeah, yeah. yeah and so yeah, so that's where Tombstone is now. He's like all stony, still can't take on a Hulk. Uh, um, no, yeah. but who can? Besides Thor. Yeah, but you know, you know, Jen Walters is a lawyer. Why do you go in the lawyer bar and start smashing stuff when you know there is at least one really, really powerful superhuman lawyer in New York City who's based in New York City, no less? It's not like it's like, oh, hey, you know, she's like an LA lawyer and she was visiting. No, she actually lives in New York, probably goes to that bar all the time, you know? <laughs> so. No, it's- I- Tombstone, not the biggest thinker. And it's funny you mentioned that because Daredevil, next issue, Daredevil came out this week and uh, Tombstone came after Matt Murdock again when Jen Walters wasn't around. So, Yeah. Well, that's at least a little more understandable. But first of all, yeah. Tombstone's not a big thinker. I always thought he was. I thought he was supposed to be like a criminal mastermind kind of guy. 
Uh, at least for the last few years, they've played him off as like, you know, well, I mean, they kind of so sort of like crime, crime Lord, but yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of a crime Lord, but he, you know, not the smartest. I mean, right now, the whole thing that's going after Matt Murdock, he, he's doing that for the Kingpin, Wilson Fisk. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think they're kind of, uh, they kind of dumbed down. To, I remember when I first met Tombstone in some Spider-Man book years ago, he was like supposed to be like a real cruel, but super intelligent. He was your basic, he was your basic non-powered villain, which is that he, yeah, he was a tough guy, but he was thinking he was always one step ahead and he was using, you know, extreme cruelty and violence to maintain his order, mm -hmm. you know, but maybe it's just, you know, you get superpowers, you just start acting dumb because, you know, you don't need to think anymore because you think you're so strong. But like Man Mountain Marco, who knows? Man Mountain Marco might have been a really strategic boxer back in the day, like back before he got his powers. He might have been like a real, real intellectual in the ring. And then, you know, the game powers. And he's like, yeah, I don't got to do no thinking no more. Done with that. And, uh, and then you get to be the butt of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> But it's a joke with the Marvel Universe, yeah. You know. Uh, anyway, but that was the good news from Marvel is that the that the rumor Scorpion will be in Black Cat and Silver Stable, implying that the the Spider Verse spinoffs are part of the MCU in their own way, which is good, you know. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, you know, it's not that unusual because, of course, in the books, you often have heroes and villains that kind of stick to their books, that kind of stick to their things, you know. It's very rare that you're going to see the wizard go attack someone other than Reed Richards, you know. Human Torch. So, you know, or the Human Torch, yeah. Well, it's still all Fox properties. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else you want to talk about tonight, Phil? Anything that uh, has been sticking in your craw of late? What were you going to say about the DC universe? Because I do want to get into my Wonder Woman fan theory. Uh, well, they made an, I guess they made an, the announcement today at Comic-Con that um, mm -hmm. big D, big DC EU news, um, I guess after the Justice League movie, um, what, how did they put it? Uh, ben Affleck is going to be, uh, how did they put it? Well, basically he's going to be shown the door and they're, and they're either going to recast the part of Batman or they're going to, uh, I guess, focus, maybe not focus on the character of Batman. But hey, if we have, hey, if we have, like, like Rob was saying, maybe do we go with Nightwing or, you know, if we have the character yeah. of Nightwing, he, you know, he stepped in that identity before. That fuck was a bad Batman. <laughs> and honestly, I don't even think that I, 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 of course, I didn't read the Ben Affleck bat Batman, but like I said, I think I said this like last episode of the episode before, you know, the poor guy was told to go write a Batman film for the Snyderverse. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no, no, it's not the Snyderverse anymore. Now it's the Jenkins verse. And, you know, all this stuff you wrote, we can't use it. And it's like, okay. And then rather than letting him rewrite it, they're like, you know, because, you know, for what it's worth, he probably tried to defend it too hard. Mm. Like, oh, we can make it, but Batman, he, well, he might have said something crazy. Like, no, Batman is actually supposed to be the dark character. He's yeah. still the Dark Knight. But Marvel, but DC was like, no, 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 everybody's happy. We want something more 60s Batman. You know, uh, so worry about the Batman. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the whole that whole the Batman movie is going back to basics. I mean, originally they're supposed to have Deathstroke. Who knows if that's even going to happen now? Oh, Deathstroke and Batman. It was yeah. that, was, that was originally the way it was supposed to be, but now that they said they've thrown out his script, they've thrown out everything. So who knows? Yeah, because I don't know. I don't. I don't think of Deathstroke as a particularly um, Batmany villain. No, he's supposed to be. He, he originally was a Titans villain. Yeah, well, exactly. He's he's, he's a he, he's a Robin villain. I've, I've yeah. lost the Titans. Yeah, he's Robin's arch nemesis, not Batman. And so, yeah, why are you gonna have? I mean, let's do Nightwing, and that might be cool. Uh, you know, maybe that. You know, maybe you have that. I would love to see that dynamic with Batman and Nightwing in that grown-up universe. You know. Oh, okay. So he would be a good story for Batman. Batman recruits a new Robin. You know, maybe it's Jason Todd. Maybe it's Damian Wayne. Who knows? Who knows what how the story opens? And then you have Nightwing coming in. And it's like, you're really bringing another kid into this, you know? And oh, so, so here's what you have. So you have, so you have dead Jason Todd. You have Nightwing. And that that's like was your split between them because of course you know, you know Nightwing kind of matured out of the role and then Jason Todd showed up and he got to be it and then Jason Todd dies and that's why Batman goes dark and then you have Nightwing coming back and then you have young Damian Wayne coming into this 
and you have them and you have this be this kind of thing of you know this conflict between nightwing and batman over you know maybe this isn't the, a world where children should be and then you have damien saying i don't know who you think i am nightwing but you know i i grew up in this world this mm-hmm. you know i i didn't i didn't get adopted from the circus i i grew up in a world of death and 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 morbidity and this is my father and i am going to follow in him footsteps because i want to be because because if i must be a monster i would like to be the monster of, of righteousness you know you know i would rather be the i would rather be god righteous the angel of righteous vengeance rather than the angel of destruction you know um so that's an interesting idea uh you know i don't know what ben affleck wrote um like i said there there, there is this uh there is a lot of theory that, you know, uh, Matt Damon did most of the writing on Goodwill Hunting and Ben Affleck kind of signed his name at the end. That's a theory. I don't know, but I have heard that suggested. Uh, so how good of a writer Ben Affleck really is is debatable, but, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault the poor guy. I'm not going to kick a man when he's down. Uh, but anyway, speaking of DC, this is actually this one thing I realized do you know why Wonder Woman is such a great show? It's been such a great movie, been so popular. Uh, why? Because it's a Superman movie. So the premise of Superman is that he is this kid from who has been raised in a good place. He's been raised in Smallville. He's been taught righteousness and goodness and decency and told that humanity is a good thing. Human- humans are valuable. And then he comes to Metropolis and sees the darkness and despair of Metropolis. And he works through it. He comes through his naivete, but he doesn't lose his sense of goodness and righteousness. And, and that is what makes Superman a great character in his tales. Because even though he has every reason to realize the stories he's been told about humanity are a lie or that humans really are, you know, you know, big jerky outsides with big jerky insides inside, you know, he knows that that's not true. And even though he may see the worst of humanity and know it's not to be blamed on some outside force, still in there. And that is what I think the real beauty of Wonder Woman is, is that she in this place where she comes with this great naivete. And the entire first part of the story is about dealing with that naivete, trying to cling to that naivete, even as she has shown the real horrors of humanity. At the end of it, still find reasons for decency and righteousness. And I think that, you know, with the loss of Steve Trevor... It's easy to argue that, oh, well, maybe she winds up, you know, becoming so bitter and cynical. But now we know she comes back in the 80s. So obviously, for all of she, for all that she has endured, she is not going to be walking away from humanity. We know that she's still actively involved in charities because maybe she feels that's what a superhero should do. You know, that it's not about punching bad guys. It's about providing opportunities for other people it's about being a hero well i was thinking about that wonder woman too yeah they said set in the 80s maybe she never takes a break maybe she you know between world war one and the 80s she just works behind the scenes more but like the 80s is the next Mm -hmm. time she actually puts the suit on maybe you know i mean like i said i would love to see her in a white i would love to see her in the white jumpsuit (laughs) with the powers but still but in a white jumpsuit because you know that armor it looks cool but it is impractical. I bet I, I could see like if they do like flashbacks, you know, of like the pe- previous decades, so you get her like in the white jumpsuit. But yeah, then in the 80s, she has to like suit up against, you know, whatever. Wow. I don't know any reason why. Honestly, it's like it's fine that she wants to wear it, you know, and it's a uniform. Um, but, you know, I want her to I want her to be a super powered black widow. You know, I want her to be I want her to just be practical in her Amazonianness. You know, Charlie, 
Branding. I want to see. Huh. How yeah. many times have we talked about this? Branding. Yeah, branding, branding, branding. <sighs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so there you go, branding. Okay. Though I do want to see her like with an AK. And like I said, I think it would be really cool to see her in Afghanistan, you know, either fighting for the Soviets, which would be cool. I would love to see that. I would love to see her with the Soviets, you know. You know, there is a great Afghan war movie, which I believe stars Kevin Bacon as a tank commander. And it's about, you know, like the la- this tank in Afghanistan and they're, you know, and they're, you know, they're just these guys and they're, you know, fighting, you know, fighting to keep, you know, keep Afga- Afghanistan from falling into, you know, Mujahideen hands, you know, which now sounds practical. But, you know, of course, at the time that we were like, no, darn you, communists. Ah. <sighs> But it was it's a really good film. I can't remember the name of it. Um like I said, I really want to say it was Kevin Bacon as a tank commander in Afghanistan. Uh let me see if I can Kevin Bacon tank commander Afghanistan film. If something comes up. Uh Kevin uh Soviet T Fitch Firewood. Okay, here we go. The film is called The Beast. And it stars cast uh, no one I've ever heard of, but it and, sounds like that's it. It's a, yeah, I don't see Kevin Bacon on the list, but oh. that's okay. It, probably just some other blonde-haired, you know, guy. It's it was directed by Kevin Reynolds. Uh, I see George Zunza, Jason Patrick, Stephen Bauer, Steve. Oh, Stephen Baldwin. That must be who I'm thinking of. Eric Cavari and Don Harvey. Harvey um, and Marcus Sham, I believe. Oh no, Marcus Sham did the music. Uh, Tank Chu, who's the four Soviets and an Am- Afghan communist soldier, as night falls, the crew sets up camp. The Afghan tank crew, uh, Samad, educates the tank driver, uh, Konstantin Kachovic, about the fundamental principles of uh, Pashtunwa- Pashtunwali and Pashtun people's code of honor. Uh, Mastia, Hospitality, Badal, Revenge, and Nanawatai, which requires even an enemy to give in sanctuary if he asks. Um, yes, it was a really good film. Highly recommend it. The Beast. Look it up. Um, does not star Kevin Bacon, but that's how memory works sometimes. You want to put a bigger star in a film than it had. But, uh, oh, hey, it did have a Baldwin back at the at peak. 1980, in 1980s, that was peak Baldwin. You had to remember. I think, you know, 1988, peak Baldwin era. Uh, so you get a Stephen Baldwin in there. That's that's a good, good film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, you know, but you can see, and that idea of huma- humanizing the Soviet soldiers in their conflict with the Mujahideen, I think that you have a real interesting story to tell. Huh. Like I said, you know, that's the thing. It's like they say, oh, we're setting it in the 1980s. Everyone assumes it's in the American 1980s. Mm-hmm. But there was a whole other world outside of the America in the 1980s, you know? Well, we were all having, you know, and Ronald Reagan, the rest of the world was dealing with stuff. And uh, so I, for one, hope that wherever, 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 uh, wonder wherever Diana and Etta wind up, because Etta is going to be there, man. Etta is going to, Etta is there. Etta is, Etta will be, here's my, here's my prediction. Etta will be the proto Amanda Waller. Because hmm. she's already in the spy service and we already know that she's tough as nails. And I want to see Etta Candy just being reimagined as this, you know, woman behind the scenes, the superhuman situation forward for for the for whatever checkmate or spiral or whatever the organizations are called in the DC universe. I want to see Etta at the helm, you know, to see like in the 80s, some, you know, six year old Etta still not giving a fudge what you think. Maybe with an eye patch. That would be awesome. Really? You know, smoking a big old cigar. Uh, that's my Etta. So, I mean, that's what I would like to see. I think that's a real possibility. 
they're not going to do it. But, you know, that would it be would be good. nice if they did. That would be good, though, if they set up, like, Checkmate or Spiral, like you are saying, one of these organizations in the DC universe, and then, like, in Suicide Squad 2 or something, the squad has to, you know, they're up against Checkmate or something. You know, enough with the supernatural mm-hmm. stuff with, you know, Suicide Squad, you know. Yeah. Do some political stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, except both their magical characters are dead now, right? They're automatic because, like, Diablo died and and Enchantress died. Yeah. Yeah, I know they said definitely Enchantress isn't coming back. So, but I just meant, Uh, yeah, like the threat. Yeah, you know, I don't. Yeah, don't no no more supernatural threat. You know, do something more grounded. Yeah, but I do like the idea of Etta Candy. Be you know, and I would love to see maybe even a scene. You know, you age up, you you youth up Amanda, and you have Etta maybe being like the 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 tutor to young Amanda. You know, <laughs> I would love to see that. Oh man, you want to just kick a Bechdel test in the butt? You have old Etta, young Amanda, sort of you know talking about business, about the business of spies, and how you you say you know even even maybe showing a more cynical side of Ed- edda you know like yeah you know i love diana she's my best friend but you know you can't tell her everything she needs to know you know <laughs> it's too optimistic oh. Yeah, she is too optimistic, you know, because, you know, what? it's easy to be optimistic when you can defel- deflect bullets with your bracelets. Yeah. You know, that's what Batman that's always tells the when you're a demigod, Yeah. Well, you know, if you're a demi, you know, although as, as has been presented very much recently, she is not bulletproof. Okay. So <laughs> remember that, kids. <laughs> Amazon's one weakness, bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Lead. Yeah. Oh, uh, apparently they're they're whatever that Monel cat was from. Um, <laughs> yeah, Daxum. Yeah, it, it does make a kind of funny thing that idea that you could destroy him with a musket ball. Yeah. <laughs> so worry, I am a Daxamite. I am invulnerable to so many things. Okay, here's a musket. Oh man, that that hurts. Funny story, true story about Afghanistan. Um, one of the ways the Mujahideen actually brought down uh Hueys, um you know the big armored helicopters that the russians were using back then uh was with muskets and people said well you know because they were had been designed to stop modern weaponry but what happened is is that you had these guys that were literally using lead musket ball guns and they would take a musket and they would hit the and this may be somewhat apocryphal but this is the story i heard you tell it it hit stabilizer um, uh, of the of the helicopter with a musket ball, hmm. and the musket ball would then smear on it, which would throw the uh, stabler stabilizer out of whack because it wouldn't be properly weighted anymore, and the stabilizer would eventually break off, and then the helicopter would just spiral down onto the ground, and then you could attack them. Um, so, inter- so funny story, true story about how. Low end technology can take down really uh, advanced weaponry because they don't think to protect it against something very old. It's like they say, you know, the real problem with um, with uh, bulletproof vests is they don't stop knives. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. Here. So that was so we did Marvel. We did DC. Uh, we said why why Marvel sucks and DC is pretty cool. And um, yeah, man. Uh, not feeling the Marvel right now. Um, I mean, I'm still feeling Black Panther. You know, oh, yeah. Black Panther is Black Panther is a redemption. Oh, there, there we go. Did you see the the Stan Lee narrated Defenders trailer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that made my heart sore. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, you part of you wonders like, will Stan Lee be a character in this, or is he just being a watcher? In a limo, driving around uh, New York City, talking about these defenders, be pretty amazing. I really love that, and uh, a fine tribute to uh, Stan the Man at this point in, uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Okay, anything else to talk about tonight, Phil? Uh, no, I think that's it. Uh, join us tomorrow morning, and maybe later on in the day, we're gonna have, we're gonna be discussing all the Comic Con stuff uh, mm-hmm. on Capes and Lunatics tomorrow. Yay, Capes! Yay, Lunatics! Hopefully, okay. Hopefully we'll get a live uh report from our uh our reporter on the scene. Yeah, we're doing that at nine AM. That's six AM in California. 
Yeah. And if, if, um, something, if something big hits, maybe some of us will jump back on that night. So tomorrow. Right, well, we'll see what happens. Um, okay. Uh, Phil, if they would like to give us a call on the old telephone, the ways Ooh. our grandmas and grandpas once said, how can they do that? Well, if you want to send us a voicemail on anything uh, you've heard or you want us to discuss, uh, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. Uh, mm-hmm. Our my my Twitter and the uh, Capes and Lunatics Twitter is right there at Nightwing PDP and at Capes Lunatics and uh, oh yeah Super Connectivity we're on Twitter also at Super Connect Pod so follow us we're all on Facebook there we go yeah and me my social media game is weak but if you'd like to w- write to me in that old fashioned email way the way our mods and pods once said you can always do so at Super Connectivity Blog at Gmail dot com that Super Connectivity Blog all one word at gmail.com and of course follow me on the twitters as i live tweet ah, i guess in humans eventually s e h a r l i e s s e r look for the two e's in the middle for wallet connecting with us ladies and gentlemen please connect with us one good night